Welcome to another Thursday with Third Path webinar. I'm always excited about these webinars, but I am super excited about this one because I have a couple of my favorite people on the webinar with me. Bridget Schulte, who I met while she was working on her amazing book, Overwhelmed Work, Love, and Play When No One Has a Time. If you haven't read it, you've got to go get it. I mean, seriously, it's one of my favorite books around all these issues that Third Path cares about so well, and it's so readable because she really shares a lot of her own personal story in it as well. We also have Alex Durand. He's now, I'm happy to say, a Third Path board member. Um, I met Alex. Uh, he does uh, executive and team and emerging leadership coaching. Uh, he is, um, I guess one could argue, a millennial too, um, and has really uh, great knowledge about that generation, but I think about all generations. He's, as I've told Alex many times, wise beyond his years. So we're going to be talking about that exact thing today, where we're looking at how do some of those ideas that Bridget talked about in her book, Overwhelmed, apply to us when we're first starting our careers? Uh, because I think there's a lot of steps we could take early in our careers that will help us make wiser choices later on. Um, Bridget's actually going to talk after Alex has kind of set the stage for us. But Bridget, we're really glad you're here um, and looking forward to hearing you share some wisdom um, as we get further into the call. Yeah, no, I'm delighted to be here. This is a really exciting conversation. Thank you so much for having me as part of it. Yeah, wonderful. Terrific. Um, and what we're going to do is start with Alex sharing some thoughts about what we've learned around what it looks like going through early career stages. Um, and uh, one of the things that's interesting about this particular group of people going through early career, the early career stage, is that they also had a very transformational point of time in their own lives. Let's see, let me say it slightly different. The world was changing dramatically as they were growing up. And therefore, as they enter the workplace, they're entering the workplace very different people than the people before them. So Alex and I are going to tease apart this concept of millennials versus early career. Um, but we do want to talk a little bit about how, as millennials, they're bringing some very exciting things to the workplace. Um, and uh, that is going to be really, I believe, really useful for organizations. Uh, one way I thought that would be fun to explain the difference about how this group coming into the early career stage are different was through a quick life story. And then I'll have Alex talk a little bit more about millennials and the early career stages. So this is a picture of my family. And, you know, uh, I actually have a wonderful millennial child. Uh, Jossie was born in 1990. Um, and so I have a little timeline here to talk about how uh, people who are, are in the early career and, you know, early family stages actually are this millennial group have really gone through some very unique changes in the world. Um, some of it's my story. Some of it's her story. Um, I actually remember very much in 1992 getting my first laptop. The whole idea of a laptop was kind of a new idea. I mean, even personal computers was not that new was still new uh, back back then. Um, and I remember when I graduated from Wharton, someone telling me about email in 1994 and, and being kind of blown away by this concept of email, you know, and think about where we are today with email. Um, and then, you know, of course, Julian was born, but uh, uh, then there was this big event that happened in Jocelyn's life. I remember it very specifically. She was in fifth grade when 9-11 happened. And I, I could tell you a story, very dramatic story about what that experience was like for, for her and obviously so many other people. Um, but that's a big event that happened in her life that we all have memories of. Um, and then I can remember in eighth grade, 2003, Jocelyn had her first cell phone. Um, and if you saw it, you would laugh because it was one of those really funny looking phones back then that's so different than the phones we have today. Uh, but if you think about it again, Julian, later on, when he was her age in eighth grade, people all had smartphones. Um, so uh, in such a short amount of time, things were really changing for this generation of people and for their parents. Uh, I remember Facebook 
being launched because there was actually some other program my daughter was using before Facebook. Maybe somebody on the call even remembers what it is. Um, but, you know, think about that and how, uh, you know, Jossie and Julian really uh, the way that they connect with each other dramatically changed, both because they could reach each other directly through cell phones as friends and stay connected to each other through Facebook. It really changed the landscape for how they connected to each other as people and, um, and social networks, et cetera. So this is all within her lifetime. These big changes happened that I was watching unfold. Um, and then, of course, you know, some of you might have experienced this, too. I was talking to somebody who actually graduated from a graduate program when the Great Recession hit. And think about what that felt like to have gone through college, gone through graduate school, and then to hit this recession that nobody had ever seen the likes of before. Um, so all of these things have shaped Jocelyn's world and shaped who she is as a young career early career person um, and obviously shaped Julian too. And so when we talk about millennials, we're talking about people who have gone through these kinds of experiences and they're bringing those experiences and that new way of thinking to the workplace. Um, and I think the big message in today's call is that they're going to help us be smarter in our workplaces and they're helping us reach for what's possible, our potential at workplaces but clearly there are some hurdles they're going to hit along the way. So that's what we're going to talk about is we're going to try to set the stage of what, what are some of these factors that we need to think about. Um, and one of the ways that we're going to get this started is having Alex and I talk a little bit about what we've learned about millennials um, and how they're doing work differently, how they're um, connecting with people differently, um, how they really want to have time for life. So Alex, I put a couple of slides up that we're going to talk about. This is the first one. What do you think about millennials and early, slash early career people wanting to do work differently? Is that something you're seeing? What are, what are you seeing? Yeah, hi, Jessica. Thanks for setting that up. First and foremost, thank you to, to you and to Andy and to everybody else that helped to organize this call. Uh, and it's a pleasure to, to be sharing this space with Bridget here today. Her, and I second uh, your opinion about her book, it was definitely one of the, the first reads coming out of the corporate life that shaped and inspired the way that I reorganized and redesigned my life. So it's really a, a, a pleasure to be sharing this space with her today. Uh, yeah, so I think that I love the story about uh, you watching your kids and the changes that they've gone through in their in their lifetime at the micro and the macro level. Uh, and, and I think it's important to set up that uh, you know, we often hear generational cohorting terms used today, uh, specifically when we use millennials, it's typically used to refer to people born uh, around between 1980 and the early 2000s. The range tends to change a little bit, but that's that's really kind of where that plays out. Um, millennials are, are in the history of generational cohorting. They're the fourth, uh, you know, people, sociologists and anthropologists started to look at uh, uh, cohorts of, of generations post uh, Great Depression after the 1920s to see how major macroeconomic effects impact the population. And so then you had the boomers and Gen X. Uh, and so here we are talking about millennials who are now mostly entering the work uh, the workspace and some who are older are actually entering their, their mid-career. Uh, and so behind millennials, you have, you're going to hear a lot of conversations in the upcoming years about Gen Z, the, the people who uh, are really in their youth and, and starting to approach college and, and how they have really grown up as digital natives. So that'll be a different conversation for another time. But I wanted to set the stage in terms of the words that we're using. Um, and in terms of early career path, uh, yeah, they're, they're definitely the millennials are in the thick of it. Uh, people coming out of high school or out of college and, and getting thrown into the workforce. So these slides that we're seeing here, I'm going to let you read them, but it, it really comes down to the summary of what we were talking about here are behavioral trends and themes of this group of people that we call millennials. And while we can't put them all in the bucket, these are some uh, patterns that have come up over different studies, uh, you know, not only in the United States, but uh, cross-culturally, uh, cross-nationally. So. What, what we see today that millennials are looking for in, in a nutshell often is autonomy. They are, are often seeking challenging work. Uh, they're looking for community and they're, they're, they crave engagement. 
Uh, and I hope that over the course of this next hour, we'll be able to parse that out a little bit and get into what this really means. But what I, what I see in, in the work that I do to support people uh, is a generation that has grown up, like any other generation, as a byproduct of the macro circumstances and context around it, uh, and who likewise are also trying to put their own stamp in their own time. Uh, and so you see uh, people who are, uh, you know, either unwilling or uh, just don't want to give in to the way the system is because it is, and they want to challenge what it means to work. They want to challenge what it means to to live a complete life. Uh, and in many, in some cases, we see them doing that successfully, and in others, we see millennials struggling, just like every generation before it. Uh, and one yeah. of the things that I think is important to mention. Uh, before I hand it over, is that some of the themes that we see in millennials today are also being reflected in their older cohorts. And so uh, it's important to see that the way that all of us approach work and life, I think, is evolving within our lifetime. Uh, and it's and it's exciting to see how this specific younger cohort is is going to be a part of that larger discussion. Well, well said. Thank you very much. Um, and, you know, I hope what you hear is a lot of, again, very important points in Alex's discussion there, because, uh, you know, it's not that millennials are, you know, so radically different, but they've grown up with computers and cell phones in a way that, you know, my generation didn't. And they've connected in ways that my generation didn't. So it just means they came to the work with, with those experiences. And as a result, you know, they've learned that you can do work in a very different way, you know, and they've learned that you can use computers and technology to reduce drudgery and uh, improve work processes. And I've seen that myself, uh, both with my kids and the wisdom that they've brought to the different tasks that they've been involved with and with some of my um, employees who are in a younger generation. They've really brought a lot of wisdom around how to do work differently in a more flexible way that I think is a real benefit to workplaces. Um, and then this idea of connection. Uh, Alex, there's some assumptions, assumptions out there that you know somehow millennials don't wanna actually talk to each other face to face, they just use technology. But we had a really great call with one of them, a person who did some research around millennials. And you know what she said is, you know, no, that's not actually the case, that they'll use technology and they like face to face connection um, and they really like being at work as a way to kind of build a friendship group. What do you think about all that, Alex? Yeah, I, th I thought that was interesting. And, and you know, I, I think it's important to understand why. I mean, as, as our world has become more digital, our physical living, breathing communities have become fragmented. And so while we do have a lot of people spending time on their computers or on their phones, I think there's something inborn innate in us that unconsciously craves that physical connection with other people. And so when I work with my clients now or with organizations, uh, a lot of what you hear are, uh, you know, I, I wanna do challenging and fulfilling work and I want it to have an impact, but I wanna do that with people that I enjoy spending time around, people that are gonna add value to my life uh, or at least to the feeling while I'm at the office. And so uh, I think that this younger generation is looking at the office as not just a space in which you come in, uh, work, uh, and then get out and, and find that, those communities elsewhere. I think because so many millennials are spending just as much time as everybody else at work, they're saying, why can't we also have that uh, community and social engagement component with, with the people that we're spending this much time with? Yeah. So I think that we're, we're craving, it's kind of like a backlash to the to a response to yes we live a lot more of our lives digitally but uh i think our bodies and our minds and 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 our energies bring us back to wanting that person-to-person -person interaction in the spaces that we occupy most often yeah yeah and then you know i'm not going to spend much time on this slide at all because we just are short on time but one of the things we really learn now we've been you know following these integrated people over the course of their lives and we really learned that you know making some decisions around how to kind of build strong relationships and connect to people in a thoughtful way um, actually helps develop some really important skills around setting boundaries at work in a thoughtful way that really work for you and work for the organization. So 
the millennials desire to kind of build connection is really connected to some of what we're seeing in our integrators leaders ability to kind of set up reasonable expectations for teams to accomplish so that we can all live whole lives, which of course is something we've heard a lot about the millennials is that they want to have time for work and life. Yay. We believe in that too. Um, is that what you're seeing in some of the millennials that you work with? And, 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 it, and are you, have you learned what's made that challenging or some things that they've learned uh, that makes that more possible? What are you seeing around millennials wanting to live whole lives? I think this is where the millennial case gets interesting because ideologically, the majority of millennials do want this integrated holistic way of living in which they want it all, like many of us do, right? They, they want to be able to do impactful and engaging work, and they also want to have enriching lives. But what you see behaviorally with millennials, even still today, is that they're repeating patterns of previous generations in the office space themselves. In other words, a lot of the clients that I work with, whether they're coming from a startup culture or whether they're looking at tenured organizations, they still get caught up in the cultures that they go to work for. And so even though they want these ideologies to, uh, be, to come to fruition for them, they still struggle to find a way to, of creating that integrated life because the cultures above them are still changing at perhaps a, a different pace than they are. And they have bosses, they have, you know, the organizations are, are, have been built culturally for, for years now. And so what I see them is they are struggling to create the boundaries necessary uh, to find the role models and to find the advocates who are gonna help uh, carve a little bit of the way in front of them so that it becomes easier for them to live this, this integrated life. So what I'm seeing right now is a lot of people who want this and still just as many who are having a tough time figuring out how to do it. Yeah. Yeah. Amen to that. Um, and that's why we're having this webinar today. Um, actually, it's why we're having the theme all year long, because, you know, uh, one of the other things that <clears throat> Alex is, is he's part of our integrated life advocate community. Um, so they are career counselors, couples counselors, work life coaches or interested professionals who want to help make a case for people to follow an integrated path if that's what they're looking for. And um, Alex is part of one of my experts group, ILA experts group, and we've been talking about this exact issue that when you choose an integrated path, it's not like you choose it once. You have to choose it over and over again. If that's what you're looking for and you want to have a life where you have time for work and time for whatever else it is, family, et cetera, um, you, you have to keep on thinking about this and making a commitment to it over time. Um, and so we hope that millennials will listen into this call, but also listen to some of the future calls because we're talking about how they can keep on making this choice over their life course. But given today's focus, uh, we have a little handout that we created for this year of calls that kind of talks about at each life stage, some of the roadblocks that they face and some of the potential fun that you can have at each stage. In fact, if you want us to um, put a packet of materials that go connected to this year's calls in a mail for you, we've got an email address right there for you to send it to. So Alex, yes, there is some roadblocks. There are these pressures, um, these organizations that still probably are um, following some uh, older patterns around how work is done and who gets promoted at work. Uh, let's talk a little about those, and then let's also talk about the opportunities. We've mentioned a few of them here. You want to talk about them, or is there any others that you would like to add to the list of, of potential roadblocks? Yeah, yeah, no, I think the, I mean, I, I, you know, one of the things that we've talked about in, on other Third Path Calls I lay or otherwise around the webinars is that, that money is a theme uh, at all stages of the life cycle, right? And yeah. that while the role of money evolves in, depending on what stage of the life cycle you're in, it's always something that's, that 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 uh, makes it to the top of things that I'm thinking about, right? On people's yeah. on people's lists. Um, I think it's important to understand that the education system that millennials grew up with has been changing since the time that they were born. And you know, those of you that have kids understand how from grade school things have become about uh, much more competitive. And by the time that you get to college, the focus is really on how do I find 
uh, that great paying job that not only validates how much I'm, uh, you know, my parents or the debt that I've incurred uh, for the cost of this education. Um, and that sort of sets the tone for a whole group of millennials who are uh, either un unemployed or underemployed, uh, as well as another part of millennials who are employed uh, and have maybe found that high paying job. But almost all of them at the end of the day have asked themselves, like, now what? What was that all for? So one of the things, uh, a lot of the, the conversations that I have with this age group has to be around how do I make meaning out of the people who have invested in me, the decisions that I've made early on in my life, and how do I honor that while also making the difficult decision of perhaps going in a different way uh, than I originally thought I was I was going to go in. So, um, you know, really one of the challenges uh, that I see is that those that do find the the, the money in their careers. Uh, the more they get promoted, the, har the harder it is to step away from the money. And the, the, the longer you go on that track, the harder it becomes to change the way you live to the point where most people wait until they have partners and start having a family. And then it's like, I can't make a change because I have other people depending on me now. So one of the challenges is really reaching this audience early enough to get them to think about these opportunities, hopefully like we're doing here and to start to build behaviors that are proactive rather than reactive. So that we we have to, as people thinking about this, we have to find the points at which that kind of conversation would be most effective. And in terms of opportunities, I think the exciting thing is we have people that are speaking the language that Third Path and that those of us here on this call most likely share. Uh, we don't have to to teach them to speak a different language. They want what, what, what they want to speak the same language and they do. And so it's really about providing them role models. It's about providing them support. And it's about the opportunities of growing our community so that it becomes easier for the people coming behind us to create a different way to work and live. Wow. Oh, I knew you were going to say all the right things. That's so great. I, I heard uh, making a life of meaning. So really stopping and thinking what's important to you, even if that's different than what seems to be the norm around you. Um, I heard you zero in on, you know, money and, and making wise choices. Actually, we have a great uh, story up on our website about a woman who worked at a very big law firm after uh, graduating from law school so that she could sock away the high salary and then leave that law firm and find the preferred law firm that she wanted to, to stay with for the long run. Um, so there's some wise choices we can make around money. Um, and we're certainly going to be talking towards the end of the call about, you know, how to combat this one, um, you know, how to find some role models, how to push back at that ideal worker norm and to understand that, yeah, it might look like only families are the ones who are flexing, but even for families, flex is hard. So maybe trying some of this stuff early in your career before you even have kids. And again, we're going to get to that a little bit later in the call. Wonderful. So I have one more slide that I, uh, uh, Alex talked a little bit about boundaries. Um, I wanted to explain this slide. We actually talk about it in detail in the first webinar of the year. Um, and I wanna take a minute to talk about this because this is something that really hit me as I was preparing for this season of webinars. You see a bunch of batteries purposely, and you see some that have a black line around them. Those are the ones we believe are people who have really been able to think in a more integrated way and say, hey, I could work all the time anywhere, but I have other things I want to get to. And so what I am trying to show in this picture is that all of us are swimming in blue, meaning work could take over our lives. But the ones who've gotten smarter about boundary setting have gotten smarter at saying, how much work do I want to do? So I have time for family, whether that's your you know, extended family, your own kids, your grandparents, your friends, his family. Um, but most importantly, they have time to recharge. If you notice very purposely, uh, a lot of the batteries that don't have boundaries around them don't have much recharge time because that's what's happened in our world. That was the unexpected consequence of a world where we, we can work more flexibly is that work is following us into the evenings, the weekends, on vacation. And so what we're trying to say today is learning to set that thoughtful boundary where it's good for you 
and good for your organization and learning to do that early in your career will help you all the way through your career. There might be something you want to add to this picture. Um, I'm going to put up one more thing before I get your thoughts, Alex, because you'll see it's connected to where we're going. But what we're trying to say and what Alex said is that it's, it's this ongoing cycle um, and there are forces at work that can make it hard for us to, to kind of put up those boundaries, but we can kind of get smarter around those forces um, if we go ahead and try some experiments, meet some right people, et cetera. What are your thoughts about this, Alex? None required, but if you want to add two, one or two, I'd love to hear them. Yeah, no, I, and nothing, nothing in particular, because I want to, I want to get to hear Bridget's thoughts on all this too. And and I think it's important that we teach our early career folks about the importance of taking the vacation days that they do get, about finding ways to recharge themselves uh, beyond vacation and, and in their daily lives about the role of uh, of eating of, of eating well and exercise and and all those things in a holistic way so that they use their life as an experiment to figure out what works for them um, and to do many recharges as, uh, alongside um, you know more more intense and, and more necessary um, uh, recharges or sabbaticals as, as their careers go on. Yeah, wonderful, wonderful. Yeah, I, I got to tell you, um, just the simple act of learning how to take a vacation where you can really plan ahead and then turn off work for that vacation you're doing and then come back to work and, and not feel overwhelmed right away, that simple act of learning how to do that teaches it so many incredibly important um, integration skills. So yay for that recharge time and vacation time. As Alex mentioned, we did want to get to talking with Bridget um, she, as we, as you heard, wrote a, a great book. Um, it really talks about her life as a parent um, and trying to understand why she felt overwhelmed. But as this quote explains, uh, through the amazing research that she did and storytelling that she included, she learns that this isn't just a mommy issue, um, nor even just a parent issue. This is an everybody issue. This is about really a whole society uh, reclaiming how to live a healthier life. So Bridget, you know, I know it's an impossible question, but how would you say, what are some insights you had from your book that you want to make sure get talked about? Take a few minutes, you know, if you can, in three, four, five, talk us a little bit about your book. It's, a, it's an amazing book. Well, first of all, thank you very much to, for, for all the kind words, uh, you know, both you and Alex. Uh, and you know, uh, you Jessica, as you know, we, there's a whole chapter that I dedicate to the, to your work in Third Path, and you were really instrumental in helping me think through a lot of this, uh, both in terms of the big picture and then also in terms of my life. Um, and I think what's you know, just uh, very briefly, since we're really focusing on getting started and the start of your career, um, probably one of the biggest insights I would say when uh, that people ask me about it, it's like, you know what? Don't do what I did. Uh, and that would be the big, the, my probably my biggest uh, <laughs> advice uh, is that you know when I got started on my career, I didn't really think about how I was going to combine work and life. Uh, I didn't think about um, you know. That it was important. I pretty much dove right into uh, a very. I went into um, uh, journalism. I dove right into a an incredibly always on macho culture where you know the later you worked and the you know the more you did and the more you produced it was all part of this kind of constant one upsmanship you could never do enough you could never be enough you could never you know uh, you were never good enough what you took vacation you wimp you know what's wrong with you <laughs> and, and i have to be perfectly honest i really um i, I just um uh, I, I think I uh, I came from a generation where it was still very, you know, I was not first wave of women into the workplace by any means. There, those were the real pioneers, but I was sort of the second wave. And I think for as a woman, I felt very much that I had to prove myself. Still, you had to be twice as good, work three times as hard, and so I really took that to heart. And I didn't want to be seen as a slacker or that I needed any special accommodations. And so I worked all out all the time. And then, uh, you know, to be perfectly honest, I really put off having children because I was terrified. I could not see how I could do it. I didn't see how uh, how we could make the time for it, just my husband and I. Um, 
And I have to be perfectly honest. He had much better habits than I did. He's never worked as much as I, he still doesn't work as much as I do. <laughs> uh, he used to make me really angry. But I think that some of that is he's much better at setting boundaries. And he didn't come into the workplace with that same kind of baggage that I had about trying to prove myself. Because let's face it, I mean, all of the research shows that when you are externally motivated and you're trying to prove yourself, first of all, nobody's really watching. <laughs> Everybody hmm. else is really busy. And you can never do enough, you know, that that extrinsic motivation will just keep you running on the treadmill. Mm -hmm. And it took me really writing this book to realize that I had to find intrinsic motivation. I had to figure out for myself what worked. And I guess my one of the biggest things that I would say to people just starting out is really take the time to think about what do, you, what do you want your life to look like? How do you want to combine work and life? How do you want to combine caregiving? Uh, whether that is if you decide to have children or if you have other family members you want to take care of or you want to take care of yourself. All of those are really important uh, caregiving roles. How do you want to make space for that? Um, and, I, uh, and everything that, uh, that Alex was saying, I would just echo. I think that there's a, a couple different narratives going on when we talk about millennials or the young generation coming into the workforce. And one is that there are these slackers and they just want to have work-life balance and what's wrong with them and why don't they work all out like we did? And I do hear that from, uh, you know, I'm more the tail end of the baby boom. I hear that from colleagues of mine It's at this level. Um, and I have millennials on my staff and I have to say I'm learning from them. There is nothing in the literature or the research that shows that when you work all out, you actually do better work. In fact, that was one of the big discuss big discoveries for me as somebody who had sort of drank the Kool-Aid, is that actually leads to worse work. It leads to burnout. It leads to tunneling. It leads to being unable to see the bigger picture or being creative or innovative. And so what I would say to people just starting out is to really make the case to employers uh, that when you have, you set uh, really great priorities that are really focused uh, and tied to the mission of your work, uh, and you really make that case over and over again, how your performance is great, uh, you know, then, you know, change the conversation away from, look at me, I stayed here so late, aren't I great? And much more about like, look at what I just did and look at the impact that it had. So even reframe the conversations that you're having at work, particularly with managers who, who, let's face it, most of the managers are baby boomers. And one very important point to point out for, and for, for both men and women is that um, about you know, 78 to 80 percent of millennials are in dual income couples or partnerships and less than half of baby boomers are. Um, more, you know, more than half of the baby boomers are still in the more traditional breadwinner homemaker families. And if you have a boss who has somebody else at home sort of taking care of everything, they're not going to get the fact that you don't. And so it's really, really important that you make clear what your priorities are, uh, both to yourself and to your partner, uh, but then also communicate that at work, but through the lens of how great you're doing with the time that you do have. Yeah. And so the last things that I would just mention is we do have ideal worker norms that are still very powerful at work and millennials are getting caught up in that. So there's the sort of the slacker mentality or the sort of slacker um, uh, stereotype, which is just not true at all, because if you look at time diary data and all other research, just as Alex said, once millennials are getting into many of these corporate cultures, they're getting sucked in as well, and they are working really hard. Uh, and just to that point, I've been doing work. I'm now at the Better Life Lab at New America. I've sort of taken the book uh, experience and now really want to work on solutions. Uh, and so I direct this program where we're really looking at how do you redesign work? And we're doing some work with behavioral science. Uh, and so one really fascinating thing that we found was that in one work culture where there were a lot of millennials and people work it, were working themselves into the ground and then you had baby boomer <laughs> bosses worried about these young people burning out. And what they were discovering is that a lot of young people, they are so passionate and this is a really idealistic generation and you, you know, they want not only 
meaning out of their lives, but they want to do important, meaningful work, which I think is fantastic. But what they were finding is that people were, say, moving to another city. They didn't have like family or friends or kind of hobbies or infrastructure that would pull you out of work. And so they kept working more and more hours. And then because they were working more and more hours, they didn't have the time time to develop those networks of friendships, yeah. the time to develop hobbies or find a gym to work on. And so it became this self-perpetuating cycle. So I think that just like Alex is saying, and Jessica, as you've always said, really, really important not to, not to buy into narratives or stereotypes, but really look at your own life and what you want and recognize that there are these ideal worker norms that are very powerful in work cultures. Recognize that at home, the ideal mother and the idea that you, the, you know, that you're only a good mother if you spend all of your time with your children. And by the way, if you work, you should feel, feel really badly about it, which is crazy because the majority of mothers work in this country. Um, and then we also buy into this notion that if we're busy, it's really, you know, that that's how we show our status. And so to really live an integrated life, you have to be very intentional, take a deep breath and recognize that you are pushing against the status quo in all three of the great realms of life, work, love and play. And to do that, you have to have a constant communication with yourself, with your partner to, uh, you know, and, and really find a network of peers that can help support you in living that kind of uh, integrated life at work and at home and recognize that it's a journey. Yeah, well said, really well said. Uh, thank you for, again, sharing uh, so many good thoughts. And, you know, what you're seeing is a slide that kind of gives you some quick highlights of some of the ideas that she's talking about. You know, she starts her book by talking about how we can, you know, it actually is about doing work better and we can get really easily distracted at work. And she talks about the ideal worker norms and her section on work and how that's impacted us. And you know, one of the uh, sections that I, of course, love is the one on love, because what we've really seen over time is having that friend, having that partner in life, having that friendship group who has shares similar values as you really plays a really important role in helping you uh, step away from the, the larger forces at work and help you hold on to what's most meaningful in your life. And and gosh, she even talks about play. I mean, that's something that we can really encourage early career people to do is to make sure that they have some time for play. And what I see is, again, like Alex said, they're already talking our language. They're already thinking about this. So if you don't get caught up in that external culture, it looks like that early career generation, that millennial generation is really very excited about finding things to do that are fun, um, not just working all the time. So the big message, and then we're going to get to a, more of a conversational style, is that it's not just once, but over the life course that you're going to have to keep on making choices around um, following an integrated path, if that's the path you want to follow. And the choices you make early in your career can help you later on better manage some of those later you know, career issues when you're balancing work and family. Um, and so that's what we're going to try to help you this year and our Thursday webinars think about. Um, but today in particular, I want to use these two great experts to talk about something that I've uh, talked about many times. Um, we, we talked about it in our first webinar with Sengi, um, and I want to bring it up again here. It's the idea that you can um, use the gap between what you want in life and what your current reality is to actually get smarter and think in a new way about what you want. It can feel hard. You can literally get like a headache as you think about, oh my gosh, I really wanted X, but my current reality looks like Y. But what Sangi talks about is that actually getting smarter and smarter about what your vision is and more smarter and more realistic about what the current reality is, you will, your brain will actually develop ideas about how to bridge that gap without lowering your vision. So that's where I want to go next is, okay, so here are these new kind of workers who've come into the workplace. They're in their early career stage, facing some of the typical challenges of early career people. How do we help them not lower their goals? How do we help them experiment and think in new ways about what's possible? So the gap, the things on the left are the things that are, are kind of constraining them, early career people, the things on the right, are the opportunities that they could try out and try to make some changes. 
we've heard about some of them already. You know, get clear about what's important to you. Try to be proactive. Find a friendship group. Um, that's where I want to go next is think a little bit about how can we support millennials to take some experiments, some chances at this stage of their lives that helps them get more set up for the next stage of their life. Alex, you've been doing some listening as we heard from Bridget. What do you think would be, you've mentioned some of them, but what are some things we would encourage, want to, want to support an early career person to do um, that would really help them uh, not lower their goals, but address the gap of some of the challenges they're facing? Um, tell us some, some of the wisdom you have around this. Yeah. Um... I mean, there's there's a lot, and I think I want to echo what, what Bridget said about uh, it really comes down to what the individual wants out of their life and wants for their system. And so we live in this culture now where faster is better, and counterintuitively, the place, uh, the place to start is really slowing down and uh, encouraging people who want a, a more integrated life to create small spaces in their life, whether it be five minutes once a week, you know, uh, their commute, to really just reflect on the important questions of, you know, talking, we can use this gap here of like, okay, what do I want my life to look like? Where am I now? And what needs to change for me to get a little bit closer to that vision that I have? So it really comes just the first the first step for me is really about finding space to slow down. And it sounds easy, but it's actually really hard to do well. Because what most of us do is we daydream for microseconds at a time throughout the whole day. And we get interrupted in our reflections by emails, by meetings, by text messages, by social media, by responsibilities at home. And so what happens is all those reflections we're trying to do get fragmented into this kind of like meaningless jumbo, and then we don't get any real traction on our reflections. So the first step to me is really encouraging people to just do something that doesn't require any money, but that requires a little bit of planning on their part to say, okay, where in my week can I slow down to think about this gap and what's a baby step that I can do to start experimenting with some changes? Wow, what wisdom. Thank you. It's something that we've really learned at Third Path, and I personally practice in my life, um, that <laughs> what wisdom. I actually, uh, I've talked about this on other Thursday webinars, I actually routinely take time every week to stop and I have a friend where we exchange time and we just listen to each other for 10 minutes, and I, I think it's exactly what, Alex is talking about, it's a chance for me to gather up all that, you know, different thoughts I've had over the course of the week about, you know, am I going in the direction I want and what course corrections can I do? Um, so slowing down in a world that believes in going faster and faster is actually a really important next step uh, that, that if you're a millennial listening in, you can do. In fact, Alex is helping experiment with us uh, running an early career call uh, where we're uh, sharing some of these ideas with um, groups of early career people so they can kind of learn from each other. And if you want to learn more about that, you know, make sure you get in touch with Third Path because we could get you in touch with Alex around that too. Um, I'm putting up one more slide before, before I hear what Bridget wants to add, add is, you know, she made a good recommendation, you know, don't do what I do. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, I think she also was really good at saying, hey, I, I was in a different world back then. It's still a hard world today. Um, but women did, you know, Bridget, you really had to probably do twice as much work to prove yourself. Um, and I think that, that that was a different world. But here you are in this world that still does have an ideal worker, you early career people. And what I wanted uh, to put up before Bridget talks is, you know, it's, that sometimes as you try to explore that gap, you're going to have a lot of feelings, too. Um, one of the ones that I felt a lot is hopelessness where I felt like, wow, man, I'm still struggling with this issue. This is so crazy that I'm still struggling with this issue. And I guess what I wanted to uh, normalize is that as we're encouraging millennials, encouraging early career people to reach for their goals, not lower their goals, that probably some feelings are going to surface 
too. Bridget, does that ring any bells? And I know you've talked a little bit about this in your book too. Um, what about the, the feelings that surface and any thoughts about that or any other advice you'd give to early career people on how to hold on to their goals? Yeah, I think that's really important. You know, um, a, a couple thoughts. Yeah, it is really true that those feelings can come up, feelings of failure or discouragement or hopelessness or despair. And believe me, I felt all of them. <laughs> um, um, you know, I, I will say that one of the th is some of the work that I'm doing right now, I'm finding really, really enlightening and also very hopeful. Um, we're doing a lot of work with behavioral science, we're really trying to see if we can understand what drives work-life conflict, what drives overwork, and then can you design systems, even small nudges to change it. And I will just tell you, learning a little bit more about just uh, kind of the way human beings are wired and the way that we make decisions, it's called sort of uh, their predictable errors in our decision making, has been incredibly enlightening. And it really has lifted a lot of that hopelessness because now it, it's showing me I understand it better and I can design better systems. And for I'll just give you one example. And one is that human beings are really terrible at estimating how long things are going to take. <laughs> we are terrible at, at estimating, uh, you know, kind of it's called the planning fallacy. And that it's not just me, because I always used to think, well, I just am optimistic and I overpromise and then I don't deliver. So then I'm a failure. So that I would start this really negative kind of uh, self-criticism, this, this loop that would go on and then I would feel worse and worse about myself. So in a way, it was really freeing to find, oh, that's just humans. We're all like that. We're all really terrible at estimating. You know, you think, oh, I'll do this story. I'll write the story. It'll only take a few hours. And then two days later, you're still in the middle of it. And then you feel like a failure. But recognizing that it's going to take longer than you think. And so what you do is you consciously put into your calendar what, they, what, what some people call slack. You, yeah. you figure out that, you know, I'm not so good at planning and estimating how long it's going to take. I'm going to do my best, but I'm going to recognize that maybe I'm wrong. Maybe there's going to be th some things uh, that I'm going to get interested in that'll, or I'll get distracted or something will be difficult or there'll be something else blowing up because there usually is that you haven't predicted. So every Friday from one to three, I have on my calendar so nobody can schedule me. I have Slack scheduled. And then that's my time to... Uh, if I need to take more time on a project that I'd underestimated, I used that. Or if there was something that blew up and knocked me off course, that's the time that then I used to get back on course. Wow. So that's a small little nudge that's made a huge difference. And so then when the end of the day comes on Friday, I am much more likely to have finished sort of the goals for the week because I've created that space. Yeah. Because now I understand that humans are really bad at predicting. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And that's taken a lot of that despair away. So yeah. learning skills has been yeah. really cool. Yeah, that's that's a great example. Um, and it's funny, uh, I'll give a, a quick personal example. Uh, yesterday was a day where I knew this was a week where I didn't have much slack. And the day was not going the way I wanted to, to do. But, you know, one of the things that we've really been hopefully teaching people is that there's going to be days like that, too. And it doesn't mean you failed completely. It just means you failed that day. And so it's like being nicer to ourselves about, you know, that we're not going to get it right every time. Uh, but we are going to learn some really important skills. And Slack is a really great one. All right. So I'm going to I'm going to just put up one quick last slide before we do look at some key takeaways. Um, I hope what you've heard is that there's some things you can do today um, to try and experiment uh, with, you know, finding this more integrated approach if you're interested in it. Um, and that I, you know, I really want to emphasize that you can, you know, test it out uh, starting now. You know, you don't have to wait. Um, you, you know, uh, I, interestingly, one of my board members who works for a large law firm taught a course early in his career um, before he had kids as a way to have this other thing he was committed to and learning how to do work and this course he was teaching. Um, I also happened to went, I went to a four day work week before I had kids. Um, I felt like I wanted to learn how to do that and I wanted to have more time to do other interests. Um, so, you know, you can go ahead and do an experiment, maybe just even over the summer, uh, try, try out a four day work week over the summer, find some role models, Find some friends and a partner who share the same values as you. Um, these are things that you can really start doing today 
uh, as you try to launch into a more integrated approach. So unfortunately, we're getting close to the end of our call. I'm going to give everybody a chance to say a, a, a last takeaway, first Alex, then Bridget, about kind of some thoughts from today's conversation about encouraging early career people who want to live, a live an integrated life, how they can hold on to that goal, take some steps today that will help them be set up well for the future as they continue that integrated approach. So Alex, any last takeaways that you would want to add to the conversation? And then of course I'll have Bridget share a takeaway and we will have time for question and answers at the end. Alex, any last takeaways? Yeah, you know, I, I really just want to say that I, I want to mention that regardless of whether you're a millennial or or not, or whether you're in a different cohort, a different stage of life cycle, uh, living, attempting to live an integrated life takes courage. It takes a lot of courage and it, and you have to be willing to put yourself out there and to fail and to fail a lot. And you never really fully integrate. You just aspire to it. And sometimes you have these little victories where your life is better than it would than it, than it than it is if you hadn't tried at all. Um, and so I would encourage uh, all of us to support each other in that courage and to honor it, because the more our community grows, uh, the less alone we will feel in building an integrated life and and more importantly, an integrated culture that can support. Uh, a, a life that all of us uh, can enjoy and find enriching and challenging. So wow. be bold, be brave, and, and have courage. And, and accept that there will be failures. Thank you so much. Courage, absolutely. That's wonderful. Thank you for those great, wise last words. Bridget, you might have another wise last word to share, too. Well, I'm, not, I'm not sure how wise, but um, <laughs> I guess I, you know, I think a lot about time. You know, since that I was writing about time pressure, and I still, you know, that's a lot of what I look into. Uh, and so many of us feel such time pressure, and and a lot of that really originates at work, feeling that they're that we're never done. And you know, part of that is the twenty four seven kind of cycle, and that there are devices. There's so much work creep, and we allow some of that. And uh, you know, that is a struggle, and I struggle with that as well. And I think probably the the big thing, and it's it's really something that I continue need to work on is really think about how we value different kinds of time and that right now most of the society really values work time you know it's tied to money and success and prestige but the more that we make space for other kinds of time the kinds of time that makes you know, sort of it makes life worth living you know we all do need and want meaningful work but that is not our only identity and when you make space for you as a person, for you as a friend, for you as a family member, when you make space for the things that are just that give you joy and make you feel uh, amazing to be alive, you know, to to have the space to just even notice the changing leaves or, you know, on the trees and how beautiful that is. The more we we create space for that and the more we sort of practice making space for that, the more we're going to see how that adds so much meaning and value to our lives and the better we'll get at it. Sometimes when we start out, it's hard to imagine, but that's because we don't have a lot of experience with it. And so the more we create even little cracks, if you will, uh, and allow those to, to grow, um, you know, we really can change the way we think about time and that work does have its place in time, but it is not all the time and all, uh, you're not the only, the only thing that's valuable. Wow. Yes. Thank you. Uh, I, we, our, our recent newsletter, Take Time to Stop and Smell the Pine Trees, um, because I've really grown to appreciate uh, taking hikes. I'm now an empty nester, so I have a little bit more time on my hand. And instead of letting work take over my life, I've been working hard to say, what else do I want to create time for? And uh, Jeff and I have discovered that hiking is an incredibly powerful way to recharge. The quietness out in the woods, smelling the different smells and the sunlight is just amazing. So yay. Um, wonderful. I knew this was going to be a great call. Um, I did uh, put up a slide here there. If you are interested in learning more about our early career group, uh, we want to hear from you. Um, and we're so glad you are here today listening in to this wonderful discussion. I am going to stop the recording in a second and see if people have questions for either Bridget or Alex. 
Um, but I really want to thank everybody for being here today. What another wonderful webinar.